Today, the busted flush is a real thing. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. It's Friday and Tarek is with me. Hi, Tarek. G'day, Martin. How are you, mate? I'm pretty good. You? Yeah, not too bad, mate. I've just I've just been trying to whittle down there, this absolute pile of about 40 different charts into something resembling a coherent narrative and something we can get through in roughly an hour. Yeah, well, I think the short headline is they've stuffed up and they're starting to realise they've stuffed up and like I say, the busted flush looks as though it's happening. It's it's just it's it's ridiculous. And and I think one of the most interesting things is that not only do they realize that they've that they've stuffed up, but they keep stuffing up. You know, you keep, you know, you hear these narratives say like about China, oh, it's gonna reopen, it's gonna reopen, everything's gonna be great, stocks are all a week later, Beijing's back in lockdown. And you know, here, here we are. It just it just goes to show that you've just got to, you know, watch what they do, not what they say. Yeah, and it is interesting because, of course, China this week is talking about, uh, well, taking the um, ratio rate down a bit further to allow a little bit more um, uh, money to flow into the property sector to try and prop up that some more. The Fed minutes basically came out and said, well, yeah, rates are going to have to go higher. Might go slightly lower, higher, but they're going to go higher. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand said, oh, 0.75% this time and more more later and higher rates, panic, panic. And But it's interesting because I actually listened to um, Adrian Orr's um, presentation, the one to the press conference and also the one that he gave to, to Parliament in New Zealand. Actually, he was very coherent about it, saying, actually, you know, we've got to do stuff and we've got to do it quickly. So he was really uh, echoing... Um, Powell, I think, in terms of saying this is a critical issue. And, and whilst, of course, um, Mr. Lowe has said it's a critical issue, you know, his actions and words are, well, miles apart, really. I think that just brings us back to, you know, watch what they do, not what they say. And I mean, I think it's interesting because you've got Powell coming out and uh, and not only that, but other other Fed members. I think it was uh, Bostick the other day who basically uh, wrote in a in a paper that a recession is preferable to unchecked inflation. Yep. And, you know, you've seen that even from the likes of Lagarde, you know, Christine Lagarde at the at the European Central Bank, who's, you know, known for being the dovey, the doviest of the doves, <laughs> you know, who, who's, who basically said, you know, a mild recession is not going to be able to kill inflation. So, you know, I think reading between the lines there is they're really going to have to crush it. And that's, that's true. You look across the board, there's all of these central bank governors talking about these things very, very seriously. And in, in the instances we're talking about, doing something about them very seriously but then you get to the rba and then they just go no nah, no nah, nah, we're not gonna we're not we're not gonna follow everyone else we're just gonna do our own thing and hope for the best and you know for the moment at least that's that's that hasn't really bitten them in the ass yet but if we do start to see a stronger us dollar again we do start to see rising yields again well then then they may have a bit of a problem yeah and christopher joy right pays a piece today saying, you know, one of the reasons why the RBA is being a bit quieter in terms of rate rises is because they know that they've got this cliff next year with the fixed rate reset. But of course, there are fixed rate resets in New Zealand too. So I'm not sure that necessarily is uh, enough of an excuse to explain why the RBA is different. I think the RBA is different because they are the RBA is different, basically. Yeah, well, and you know, how, how do I put this without getting in trouble? Um, they, they are a very very you know property focused central bank you know if you if you look through you know say like the the papers you know released by the fed the papers re released by the european central bank and then the papers released by the the rba housing is something that recurs a lot lot more in the R in the rba's correspondence i mean I'll, I'll give you an example a couple of years ago they released a paper on the impact of a housing crash on the economy yep. and it concluded that the damage from the loss of the wealth effect from a housing crash of, I believe it was 30%, would be more damaging to the economy than a 10% unemployment rate. Now, whether you agree or disagree with that particular conclusion is entirely up to you, but that is the lens through which they see things. And, you know, even if you look at, you know, the major banks, you look at, say, AMP, Goldman, whoever, a 30% drop in housing prices is well and truly on the table. It's a well and, you know, it's a possibility that a lot of people are talking about, you know, I mean, I think it was even Shane Oliver the other day who said, if we're looking at, you know, a, a high threes, low 4% cash rate, 30% down is a well and truly an, uh, 
a potential that could happen. Mm, well, clearly, you know, the availability of credit and interest rates is the key determiner of uh, home prices. When you cut interest rates and when you pump more credit into the system, property prices boom, as we saw through COVID and beyond. And the reverse is also true. You put interest rates up and if you tighten lending, and you do automatically because of the uh, 3% buffer rule from APRA, it means that the borrowing power is way down, which means you can't borrow as much, which means the home prices fall. And then it's a question of, well, how far do they fall? How quickly do they fall? And as you say, how many people are then caught in the pincer movement and uh, you know the removal of wealth? And um, you know the truth is that there are some still sitting on a lot of wealth, but there are a lot that not. And as we'll see in some weekend of the charts, some um, some of those households are now looking very precarious. They are, and I think that that's a, that's a theme that I think is going to just recur throughout this show and just throughout the next couple of years. To be completely honest, that just the fact that some households are doing very very well. You know, that, I mean, say, for example, I, I was reading that, that they estimate that 100,000 people are going to through, go through the doors of, of Chadston Shopping Centre just today alone, who, you know, and some people are spending, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. But then there are obviously other people, say, for example, the people who were written about in the recent Food Bank Australia report, you know, where, where they're talking about, you know, m- millions of Australians going hungry. Yep. So... You know, but the, but the problem is, is that we we've, we seem to be stuck. Not not all of us, but just in general, there seems to be stuck on this idea that, that only one or the other can be true at any given time. When in actual fact, the the problem for the RBA and the, frankly for every Australian is that both of them are true simultaneously. Right, that's absolutely right. But then the other observation is that there is a proportion of the population who potentially are doing better that are more vociferous. They're more connected to, you know, the top end of town and to the media, et cetera, et cetera. So, and of course, they probably are more likely to, um, you know, vote with intention. Um, so that it's an unequal fight, really, between the haves and the have-nots, the, you know, the people that can survive this and the people who are struggling to survive. Um, I'm really worried about that sort of quiet third who are being crushed just quietly and gently, continually, perpetually. And the proportion of people in that group is going up. And the noise coming from the other crew, you know, saying nothing to see here, everything's absolutely fine, it gets louder and louder and louder to try and drown out the screaming, in my view. I, I, w- I really wish I could disagree with that conclusion, but I can't. And to be completely honest with you, one of the things that really annoys me at times is how much coverage the pain of rising rates gets. Now, I don't want to minimise that. I know that a lot of people are struggling and I know that a lot of people were put in a really crappy position buy the system, buy high housing prices, and just the fact that they need a place and a roof over their head. And I, and, you know, and I sympathize greatly with those people, but I think that, that, that there's also, as you say, that other third of people, and some of them are mortgage holders, I might add, that other third of people who are really, really struggling very, very badly, people who are being crushed by inflation, you know, people on, you know, welfare, people on low incomes, you know, the, the level of inflation that they are facing is a lot higher than what the CPI says for a start. I mean, even if you just go off, you know, the, the non-discretionary measure from the ABS, they're facing 8.5% inflation. Yep. But if you then look at, say, like the data of private providers for, say, rents and for, for renters, say, for example, SQM, they say that capital city rents are up 20, almost 25% in the last 12 months. These people are being absolutely crushed. But where, you know, do, do we get, you know, and not only that, but renters are a third... A third of the population, and the proportion of renters in in stress, I would I would argue, is a lot higher than the number of people who are in mortgage stress in relative terms. So I just I just think that there needs to be more coverage of that, and that's something that I'm going to get on in the next in the next couple of weeks, just showing how different people are faring in this because it, it's not it's not equal. Some people are doing a lot better than others. And I think the people on the bottom rungs of society deserve to have their story told. I absolutely agree with that. And just in terms of my surveys, you know, the definition of stress in terms of cash flow, roughly 66% of those in rental accommodation have cash flow issues at the moment, right? It's um, 44, 45, 46%, depending on when you look at it, of those with mortgages. So we've actually got a bigger problem in the rental sector. Yeah. But if you then actually use a segment lens on it, which is what I do, it's very interesting just watching where those pressure points are. The number one category of people in the rental sector are first-generation Australians, those migrants who have come into the country. 
Then you've got a lot of young growing families. And then you've got the battling urban, you know, fringe, etc. And then you've got some more affluent people who've also got pressures too. So it doesn't equally touch everybody. But the point is that in the round, the rental sector is really the canary in the coal mine here. Um, yeah. Simply because their cost of living are already a lot higher to start with. The mortgage set, still struggling, will continue to struggle. And next year, of course, that when that mortgage cliff happens, that's when we're probably going to see another big leap up. So I think that's a really good point about we've got to focus on not just you know the affluent sector and what they're doing. You've got to look at the real mainstream Australian communities and how they're travelling because that's where the pain is and that's where the pain will get worse. Indeed, and when, without going off on another tangential rant, as I as I at times do, I would also just add in terms of the rental the rental issue is that rents can't keep rising the way they're rising forever. Mm. You know, people are reaching the end of their tether. If you're seeing that in in certain markets, you're seeing that on the north, you know, the New South Wales Central Coast and New South Wales North Coast parts of Queensland in regional Queensland because people just can't afford to pay anymore. Yep. You know, they reach the point where they're just going to either move home or move somewhere else or or into a share house or whatever. And it, it just doesn't work. I mean, so they freak, say, for example, people say, oh, but, you know, landlords can keep passing on the cost. No, they can't. Eventually, it, a point is reached where they can't pass on the cost anymore. That point has been reached in parts of the US and even in our own backyard, in our own little corner of the world, in, say, Auckland, despite the fact that ra- rates are rising much, much quicker in New Zealand and landlords are getting hit even harder, well, they can't, they've lost the ability to put rents up anymore. Yep. Rents in, in, in Auckland have been flat now for months. So I think that's that's really something worth keeping in mind going forward, you know, because a lot of people are just saying, no, 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 they can just keep putting it up forever. No, they can't. Well, I can tell you that in my surveys, I'm now seeing some renters putting 43 to 45 to 47% of their monthly disposable income just trying to pay the rent, right? Hugely high. And that has gone up quite dramatically. But what's interesting too is that if you look at the the rental perspective from the point of view of the property investor, their higher costs are already accelerating faster than their ability to put the rent up to cover it. So there's a pincer movement amongst property investors too, which is why there's something like 20% less properties available across the country now than two or three years ago yeah i think i think the game has, the game has really changed in that regard and i think as well that there are there are areas and, and sub regions of the country where things are even worse i mean i read uh, recently about uh, in in the, lo- the local news up there that in the outer new outer suburban areas of newcastle that there are people paying 50 percent of their gross income on rent Yep. And that is a truly insane figure. Yep. You know, I mean, you know, that takes, you know, the, the traditional, you know, 30% definition of, of mortgage stress, of rental stress and smashes it to pieces. And, you know, that is not a uncommon thing these days. And, you know, and you, you're seeing it in, in parts of the, in, you know, regions and suburbs all over the country. Yeah, that's right. Well, that 30% rule is nonsense. And using a gross proxy is nonsense as well. I think you've got to look at disposable income and disposable spending right that's what i try to do in my surveys but a lot of people don't want to confront the hard data that that actually comes up with well talking about confronting hard data though we should probably get onto the <laughs> onto the slides or we won't actually touch them so uh, let's put this one up all right well as usual folks the charts are available at avidcom.substack.com i just want to say a big thank you to those of you who have re- recently subscribed to my patreon and who have uh, donated that is very very much appreciated helps keeps the lights on uh the links the links to do so will be in along with the the charts as usual in the description so we'll we'll get right into it now there's been a lot of discussion about Aussie housing prices recently as well there always is regardless of what direction they're moving and we are seeing prices well continuing to fall now they're falling less swiftly in sydney and melbourne arguably as a result of seasonality and frankly the fact that stock levels have collapsed to lows not seen in years however prices are still falling faster than the than in the us during the global financial crisis now it's worth noting that in a few months time the us prices will be hitting the point where the Lehman Brothers collapse occurs and that's when things really start to go downhill. But we're still running at least a couple of months ahead of where the US was in terms of price falls. So, you know, I don't, I think all, a lot of these bullish narratives on property are 
misplaced, shall we say. Uh, misplaced is an interesting word. Uh, some would say that they're desperately trying to talk the market higher, um, maybe. But I also note Brisbane. Brisbane is really me, the, you know, the leading now sort of problem. We were seeing it in the anti spruik videos that uh, I've produced over the last couple of months, and we were saying we're seeing that turn in Brisbane and actually the turn in Brisbane is spreading out into other areas of Queensland now. In fact, even in Perth and Adelaide, we're also now starting to see some considerable movements in the wrong direction in terms of falls in prices. So I'm afraid there's more journeys uh, to have, have here. And just remember, of course, that the current mortgage up rate, uplifts in terms of rates haven't all hit yet. So more people are going to be getting into quite some significant questions about what we're going to do. Are we going to have to sell or, or, or whatever? And, and meantime, a lot of people, perhaps probably investors, are saying, well, maybe I should try and sell and get out quickly and take a bit of a haircut. And I'm talking to an agent today, in fact, who said that we're seeing considerable drops in the perception of those selling now in terms of where they're prepared to start talking about sales. So that's more downward, I think, in, in terms of the months ahead. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to watch because I think that you know if once you start going granular on some of these other on some of these regions and some of these cities, they're they're not created equal. Mm -hmm. you, just, you know, th there are some affluent areas that are still performing relatively well that that I have actually seen in recent months. Say, for example, the eastern suburbs of Sydney have seen a fairly significant uptick in auction clearance rates over the last few months as people realised that rising rates weren't, weren't the immediate end of the world. So. You know, there are th this these falls are still masking relative strength in parts of some cities and, and, and some regions, while other 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 parts of other parts of the, these cities perform much much more poorly. Yeah, well, averages mask as you and I will will know, and as I keep saying, you've got to go granular to understand what's going on. And I think more than ever, actually, you've got to look local. You've got to understand how uh, sub markets are behaving, units are behaving differently to houses, and uh, different areas within postcodes are behaving differently as well. So I'm afraid these generic averages, whilst they're interesting and certainly you can get a trend over time, um, it doesn't really tell you what's going on on the ground. No, unfortunately, but. Well, we'll continue into it. Now, one thing I, this this is something I warned of in an article several months ago in news.com and then in a more in-depth one on my Substack, which you can, I'll, I'll get, I'll send Martin the link to put in the description, that seasonality is a factor in Australian housing. It's a factor in all housing. And we have seen price falls decelerate in Sydney and Melbourne. And despite the fact that Brisbane is currently meant to be experiencing some seasonal strength, the fact that it's still falling so rapidly is, well, it's not a good sign, shall we say. But what I've done here on the right is I've put the Las Vegas housing price crash up in terms of how, how, how swiftly prices were falling. Now, there was a period in June of 2008 when price falls decelerated to a little over 1% month on month when people said, look how much price falls have improved. They've, they've gone from falling over 5% in a month to only 1% in a month. The worst is over. Well, it wasn't. There was still a lot, lot more downside to go. And once again, it was seasonality. It was the, 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 that, that, summer, that, that summer demand coming in and then, well, in, and ultimately, you know, influencing prices to be stronger than they otherwise would be. And that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing the, the, the demand of, of spring coming into the market. But it's also the fact that, as I, as I mentioned previously, we have seen we, we have seen overall volumes of properties for sale collapse. And not only that, but I was looking through Westpac's recent uh, November housing price report, and they noted that Sydney had experienced the biggest collapse in turnover. Sydney and Melbourne, I should say, had experienced the biggest collapses in turnover in at least a decade. So I think that that's that relative, I wouldn't call it strength, but relative lack of weakness isn't a relative lack of weakness at all. It's just, it's just seasonality masking things and low volumes. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, if you sort of move the uh, Las Vegas chart back a few months to take account of the northern and southern hemisphere differences you know you could argue that well we're precisely in that sort of little relief bit before it goes down again right yeah exactly yeah. and i mean as you as you mentioned in terms of 
you know, the people facing the fixed rate mortgage cliff and all these other things next year. But it, I think it's also just the fact that people are just, you know, holding out for things to improve. And, you know, there's this idea that the RBA is going to ride to the rescue and nothing bad is going to be allowed to happen because we're, we're reaching that point now where normally the RBA starts slashing rates, APRA does something silly, and we end up seeing the, the property market being reignited and people are waiting for that. Yep. Now, when that doesn't happen... Well, if it doesn't happen, I should say, I'm, never, I'm not ruling out any level of stupid, but if that doesn't happen, you know, then obviously it's a whole new ball game. Mm. Well, it's interesting. I did an article um, on the uh, on the DFA talking specifically about Spain and Spain announced that they're actually supporting the mortgages of, you know, quite a lot, about a million, I think, Spaniards who are struggling with their mortgage repayments in an attempt to try and help people and, you know, implicitly support the, the property market because property in Spain is also uh, somewhat similar to what's going on here. So I'm sure we're going to see more, um, you know, mud being thrown at the walls to try and save it. But the question is, is it savable when there are so many other factors now in play? And uh, as I said earlier on, you know, when interest rates are higher, credit availability is lower and, you know, all those things. So I'm expecting APRA to say, well, well, 3%. No, no, we can take it down a bit now because most of the rate rise is there, you know, therefore we don't need to have the, uh, you know, the 3%. I'm expecting the 40-year mortgage trick. I'm expecting the, well, you can use superannuation later trick. I'm expecting the the Spanish trick. Uh, you know, there are a few others too, the migration trick. There's, there's a whole bunch of things that people can throw at this to try and save the economy and the housing sector and of course the two are so intertwined i guess the question is not how much will they do because they're definitely going to do it but will it make a difference yeah when will it make a difference and when will they do it i mean i think normally what they do with these types of things is they wait until a time an opportune time when you know things all come together say say the way things came together after the coalition won the may the may election in 2019 you know that that was a that was a turning point where it just went bang, you know, and then then APRA came out and they did their thing, and the Royal Commission fell flat on its face and everything else. You know, there was all that that conflagration of things that put a rock under that in hindsight put a rock under the market. So, you know, I think that but the problem at the moment is things things aren't getting better; they're just getting worse and worse and worse and worse. So, I think at the moment, if they were to try something like that, it would be expending ammunition on something that's basically pointless because they're still going to be crushed by, you know, further rises in rates, further deterioration. But we do have to be, as you say, we do have to be careful for when they, when an opportune moment does arise where they feel like maybe it will make a difference and we do see the kitchen sink. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, of course, they will inflation problem. So they've also worried about stoking inflation even further, right? Which is one of the reasons why the amount of money well, that you can throw some at some people are worried. Yeah, some. Some bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Only some. <laughs> uh, and I should note uh, that that chart shouldn't say October twenty fourth. It should say November twenty fifth on the left there, where it says the market has been extrapolated for November for October. It should say November. Okay, no problems. Okay. Well. okay. Um, this was posted by Christopher Joy earlier today, and basically it shows that fifteen, almost fifteen percent of households will have well, basically negative net cash flow if the cash rate goes to three point six percent, and a whole lot of other a whole level a whole lot of other households are going to basically have well, not a lot, whole lot of free spending money, which I think is interesting because for the longest time we were told that you know the banks are tested for seven percent rates and blah 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 blah. Yet the, we know we're, yet we're not we're not close to seven percent mortgage rates in aggregate yet, and. Well, it's already looking pretty bleak. And this is what the RBA, this is the RBA's conclusions. This isn't something that, you know, that, that me or Martin or anyone else has put together. Yeah, this is a, it's significant because, as you say, it's RBA data. And um, it's interesting when you actually understand the source of that data. And, of course, it's a lot of it's to do with their mortgage-backed security pools. Um, now, let me just make the point that mortgage-backed security pools are not representative of all the mortgages in the marketplace. They are, by definition, somewhat cherry-picked. So you can pretty much assume that if the RBA is seeing this in their data, then the true story is considerably worse. Um, and it's just worth you know thinking about that. And the other point there is that they're saying 50% of borrowers will be pushed into negative spare cash and risk defaulting. Now, the risk defaulting question is quite interesting, right? Because... Obviously, then it comes back to, so what will the banks do? Will they actually find a way of um, 
extending and pretending just like through COVID. I suspect that'll be there because so to my mind, the cash flow pressures and the, the, and the default, probably the default, may be less connected than perhaps some people think at the moment, depending, of course, on what the banks choose to do. Yeah, I agree. I think extend and pretend is going to make a return, you know, mortgage holidays, whatever, whatever that it takes. I mean, you, I wouldn't be surprised to see further actions by APRA to, to muddy the waters like they did during COVID, you know, make bad loans good and all that sort of business. And, you know, just where the, wherever they can tinker around the edges and do the most and sort of distort things the most to make things look okay and, you know, sort of prevent these. But at the end of the day, I mean, I don't, I don't think we're going to start to see these forced sales and stuff like that, like, you know, that like we saw in the US anytime soon. I mean, I think that's something that's years and years down the road, you know, that that's just the way things work here. You know, you, you've got, lags in the system and then you've got you know various hardship provisions and hardship processes but then by the same token you've also got the bank you know tapping people on the shoulder and just saying well it's time to walk away well that's certainly happening as i've said before on other shows and we're still seeing that in the in the conversations i have the other point there is of course that it takes two to three years to foreclose in australia so if you start the process um, it doesn't happen overnight, you know, and you have to go through a whole series of processes and you have to be served with this and that and the other. So that's something to, to bear in mind. And I suppose the other point is that um, if it's true that people are in difficulty and they knock on the bank's door and say, hey, we've got a hardship problem, and the bank says, well, okay, what we'll do is we'll give you a holiday for a few months and let yourself sort it out while you try and sell the property or those sorts of things. I mean, those, those conversations are happening. Um, they don't necessarily have to start putting provisions in their system until quite a lot later, right, if they do that. Because they are still, because they've got an agreement with the, the borrower to sort of not default, as it were, then they're not shown as a bad credit, right? Final point just on the, on the banks, they've got the term funding facility, which has to be repaid, okay? Not immediately, but over the next few months, right? That's going to put a huge upward pressure on the bank's margins because, of course, they're replacing extremely cheap money with much more expensive money. Yep, yep, exactly. I mean, you know, you're going to start that start to see those expire in the next next few in the in the next few months. But I mean, I think, but the thing is, is that that problem is only going to accelerate throughout all of 2023 and into 2024. So even if we do start to see, even if we do start to see the RBA pause or even cut moderately, the change in the TFF to actual, you know broad money, you know, from whether it's from, you know, local local investors or whether it's from, you know, offshore offshore funding, whatever, that's going to be, as you say, it's going to be a lot more expensive. So, you know, rates are going to have to be, you know, relatively higher in order to make up for that. Yeah. And of course, it also means that um, they aren't automatically getting the three point something, 3.5 or whatever, whatever the number is, the latest number, uh, because if they park money in their exchange settlements account, the RBA pays them. Yeah, no more free, no more free money. No. I, mean, I mean, God knows how much that's added to their added to their books. Um, a lot, a lot of profit. A lot. <laughs> I can of imagine. Okay, uh, there's been a lot of discussion here in Australia that basically rates are going to quickly do their job because people have so much debt, and then everything's going to be hunky dory, and we'll be cutting rates, you know, relatively shortly, and that's a relatively popular narrative. But Americans have overwhelmingly turned to credit cards during all of this. They've sent balances to all-time highs. Yet, if you look at Australian credit card exposure, we could we could whack another fifty billion on the on the old credit card before we hit the peak. And I think that's something that's really worth keeping in perspective because there are households who will keep spending because they have the savings, because they are affluent enough to have that level of create free cash flow. Then there's other households who are just turning to the plastic in order to be able to pay the bills and just get by. So I think that there is a lot. If Australians want to keep spending for another year, two years, there is the scope for them to do that and keep inflationary pressures high if that's what they choose. So some households can do that. Absolutely. Some, some households yes. can do that. What I would observe, again, from my granularity analysis that I've done, is that the credit card debt levels amongst those who are in those stressed groups and also, by the way, buy now, pay later balances is a lot higher in those stress groups. So it comes back to reinforcing what we said earlier on about the fact that we've got some households who are still generously positioned and have plenty of capacity to spend on credit card or from savings 
and this other group that don't, which is why this unequal tussle is, is really going on. And I suppose the part of the question is, well, so where, where does the pendulum need to, to sit from a monetary policy perspective, right, to try and t tame inflation? Do you want to crimp down on demand from those more affluent households? You know, which which is actually the people who are spending big and supporting the momentum in the economy and the retail sales. If that's true, you've got to put rates up quite a lot more to crimp demand. That's why the um, New Zealand discussion was quite so interesting because they're saying we have to contain demand in the system. The trouble is that this containing demand in the system is squashing that one third that we spoke about earlier on already. So. You know, where do you place the pendulum? How much pressure do you... Because you can't do it differentially using the tools they've got. No, no, you need to use fiscal policy. Mm -hmm. You need to use taxes and, and all sorts of other th different, different things in order to be able to do that. But the chances of a government using fiscal policy to effectively, you know, sort of tighten the noose around inflation, so to speak, is basically nil. I know Albo's not going to be willing to touch it with a 50-foot pole. So, you know, I mean, realistically... Yeah, I mean, if, if they want to take, if they actually genuinely want to, full, if this is like a proper embedded entrenched inflation, as some believe it is, then yeah, rates are going to have to go to four, four potentially 5% to stop those households spending. Or they need to sit at, you know, sort of three, three and a half, three point eight five, whatever it is, for a protracted period and basically crush everyone else into oblivion. So, you know, that's, <laughs> it's crap. It's it's it, it but it, unfortunately it's it's the way it's the way it works and you know unfortunately there isn't a politically viable way to 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 change that. No, the truth is you need to put taxes up, particularly yeah. for the more affluent end of the market, right? Now about those stage three tax cuts. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, if you if you're not even willing to to if they, I mean, you know, without getting into to a debate about about that and you know you know, too much. But I mean, realistically, if they want to tighten, that's what they have to, that's what they have to do. I mean, I know people won't like it and a lot of people are going to be very, very angry about it, particularly given the bracket creep and the fact that frankly, inflation is basically sending us all backwards at a million miles an hour. Yeah. But I don't know. I just, I just wish that we could have had these conversations back when, when I say we, I mean us as, as a society, not you and I. Well, you and I were talking about all this stuff a long time. I was going to say, yeah, we've been chatting. You, you know, like we were talking about, you know, these this stuff, you know, last year and before, you know, in the middle of last year and stuff like yep. that. But like it just it just gets me that we're all paying for the RBA's mistakes now. You know, we're all having our purchasing power crushed at the fastest rate in decades and it's going to take decades for that to recover. Yet, you know, they just, they just keep on keep on doing what they're doing. And the criticism that they are getting isn't for the fact that they created the problem in the first place. It's the fact that they're trying to fix it by raising rates, which is which to me is just absurd. Yeah, and I'll just remind everybody that the underlying cause of the high inflation that we've got, it's not Ukraine, it's not supply chain disruptions. It's actually because there was a vast amount of money, quote, printed, unquote, right? The, you know, look at the, the, the liquidity in the system ultra low interest rates. In other words, the RBA done it. Well, the thing that gets me as well, Martin, is the fact that we're seeing, say, for example, home equity withdrawals. You know, I mean, like your data that you recently shared with me for that article, you know, the number of people taking out as a proportion of people refinancing, taking out home equity withdrawals is surging to all time record highs. Yet the RBA is just sitting there just, just pretending that it's not an issue. It's like, guys, you, you, you go on and on and on about this budget deficit of, you know, 20, 30, 40 billion dollars, yet we've got nearly 100 billion or more flowing from home equity withdrawals into the economy, and it doesn't even rate a freaking mention. No. Yeah, exactly right. Unfortunately, um, I suppose it's the old story that if everything look, um, is going to be hit by a hammer, it's got to be a nail, right? So that's the only one thing. That, unfortunately, you know, the real world is, is rather different. But I think that this next year or so will really throw a lot of this up. Interestingly, of course, that the current review of the RBA is suggesting that the monetary policy decision making might actually be a, a subcommittee, subcommittee, you know, like an MPC or whatever, rather than actually just the, the Reserve Bank, um, which is an interesting observation because it sort of suggests that even they don't think that maybe the decisions have been pretty sensible. So, Well, I'm in two minds about that because in, in, in some ways I – Naturally, they've done a garbage, garbage job, but I'm also concerned that if they were to do that, they're basically just going to outsource it to the property lobby. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. That's the problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yes. I, I don't really see any sort of positive outcome being possible there. I mean, mm. it, you know, it's it's catch twenty two, really. Indeed. Yep. Okay. Now, in more recent years, Australians have basically fallen out of love with the old credit card. They've turned to buy now, pay later, the rise of Afterpay, ZipPay, all, all those sorts of companies. But this September, we saw the largest September increase to outstanding credit card balances ever. So I think Australians are increasingly turning to the old credit card in order to be able to in order to be able to pay the bills. And I've even been looking at other pr- prior months. Normally, July is a, is a time when Australians overwhelmingly pay down their credit card debts because they get the tax returns. Not so much this year. They paid them down, but by nowhere near as much as they have in prior years. And I'm, not in, and I'm excluding the pandemic-driven years from that as well. So I think that Australians are turning to the credit card and that's going to be a story that we're going to see slowly play out over the next couple of years. Yeah, I agree. And again, it's not equally spread across all households. There are some who are actually revolving and some who aren't. Uh, Again, a lot of those who are revolving, in other words, they've got debt on the cards, um, are doing so because they've got no alternative. And so what people tend to do is they run down their deposit savings first and then they turn to credit cards. And what you then find is they might get an extra credit card or two and, you know, put max out on that and then go on other people are still spending on credit cards but then paying it off but guess what the people paying it off are the precisely the, the ones that we talked about earlier on who actually already have plenty of money and don't don't see the problem so this sort of stretching between those two domains is getting more and more extreme and interestingly of course um there was going to be some changes potentially to some of the credit system um, well there was a deal done between the greens and labor until last night and now that whole thing and including of course uh, the um, banks now not being fined personally rather than corporately if things go none of that's going to happen because basically well Anna Bly picked up the phone and spoke to the treasurer or the assistant treasurer this is my surprise face <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes. No, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, there's not really anything more to say than that. You know, it's just, it's absurd. But by the same token, it's completely it's completely to be expected. This is Australia, after all. It, it goes to form, doesn't it? Enough said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Now, we in the September quarter, we saw the largest pay increases for Australians in at least the last decade and the largest proportion of Australians seeing pay increases in the last decade. Now, I'm still of the belief that wages growth will still be relatively relatively weak in, well, compared at least with inflation, and that that, that that will continue to be an issue going forward. But this type of data does give me pause and wonder if I'm wrong, and it's it should be giving the RBA pause as well for that matter. Well, there's a couple of observations. Firstly, you've got to look at public sector and private sector differently because the distribution and growth is very different, right? The private sector is doing quite a lot better. Um, If you then look at it by industry, there are some industries doing really well. For example, if you're in the construction trade and you want to do more hours, you know, there's plenty of that. There are others, retail is not doing badly either. There are others that are doing much more poorly. Um, So that's the first point. And the second point is, even if you've got those uplifts, they're still way below the level of inflation. Yeah. So you're still going backwards, just slightly less slowly. So, you know, it's it's a really um, it's a really interesting observation that yeah, wages growth is a bit stronger, uh, and you know the RBA said, well, of course there's going to be stronger wages growth, but then of course Phil Lowe this this week has said well, we don't want too much wages growth because if we get too much wages growth, we're going to create inflation. Hang on a moment, which way which way do you want to play the argument? <laughs> yeah, he he can't he, he doesn't know whether he's Arthur or Martha in that particular. You know, little little aspect of monetary policy. I, it's it's just it's a bit ridiculous, really. I mean, they wanted wages growth for for, for so long, and now they've got it, and they don't want it. And I don't know. I think I, I think that realistically, this 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 battle isn't going to be settled for quite some time. And I mean, there is a theory out there that Australia's wages growth is merely lagging, like like so much of our other data has lagged. And maybe that's true. I don't know. I mean, personally, I I think that. 
you know, high immigration and frankly the, the fact that we've got this big giant vacuum cleaner called the housing market sucking up all this capital will probably prevent that. But mm. the thing, that the, the big question in all of this, particularly given the RBA's recent, we wouldn't call it quite dovishness because they're still raising rates, but less hawkishness, is what if they are wrong? And what if I'm wrong? You know, if I'm wrong about this, you know, I'll get some crap from it from 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 people on the internet and, you know, and that sort of thing. And okay, that that's fine. You know, I, I get things right, I get things wrong. But if they're wrong and they're, they're incorrect, the fact that, that wages are going to keep accelerating that, and inflationary pressures are going to keep accelerating, they've put Australia in a really, really bad position because instead of tightening aggressively when they had the scope to, when the labour market was strong, when the economy was strong, when people were still spending like drunken sailors and they wait until things have slowed down and we're potentially in a downturn or even a recession, well, then doing what needs to be done is going to go I'll get a whole hell of a lot harder. That's exactly right. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I think New Zealand's an interesting case study because Adrian Orr is saying we've got to go hard, we've got to go fast because if we don't, we create a bigger problem for ourselves later. And, you know, I have to say, listening to Orr and then listening to Mr Lowe, um, there's chalk and cheese in terms of actually, you know, my perspective on how, he's, how, how they're thinking about it. I actually think the New Zealand guys are actually doing a not a bad job. It's tough on the economy, but we'll see. Do you know what's funny about that? The New, the New Zealand, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand actually has housing prices. Yes. as part of their remit, yep. yet they are the one taking the wrecking ball to housing prices. Yep. Yet here in Australia, <laughs> they, they just, you know, they say, no, 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 housing has nothing to do with us. And then Apra says, oh, no, 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 it has nothing to do with us. And they all say it has nothing to do with anyone. But then they all turn around and they, they do what they can to protect it. So I just, I just find that terribly, terribly ironic because mm. we're not actually in that different of a position, which I'm just going to get to with the next slide. Now, a lot of people are saying New Zealand wage growth is accelerating. Yes, it is. It, but the, you, you look at that there are different metrics. There's average hourly hourly wage growth is total total wages. But when you compare the favoured mechanisms of measuring wages, which are used by Statistics New Zealand and the ABS, which is Australia's wage price index and New Zealand's labour cost index, there's there's not that that much daylight between the two of them. And if Australian wages growth does continue to accelerate, as it's generally expected to, into the into this this quarter with all the various industrial action and etc. pushing uh, upward pressure on wages growth, when we're basically where the where the Kiwis are now, and they're raising rates up to you know well well above four uh, percent and raising them aggressively, so we're not that different to the Kiwis, yet the RBA is acting like we are. Right. And if you actually also align the CPI data from New Zealand and Australia, it's actually not that far uh, different between the two. No, and we have higher inflation than they yeah. do now. Yeah, correct. And, the, and the, the funny thing is, is because their data is arguably better on certain things, say like rentals, yep. they have already gotten to, to I, somewhat ironically quote lit Christine Lagarde, they've already got over that particular hump. They've, they've gone through that, they've weathered the storm, and now their inflation is lower than ours. But ours is still accelerating. Our energy price shock is still to come next year, and so is the shock from all, all those higher rents that I mentioned before feeding into the data. Because as far as the ABS is concerned, we still have low single-digit rental inflation. So all that still lays ahead. Yep. So we are in a much, much worse position than the Kiwis in a lot of ways. And we've got more trade exposure to China. Right, which yeah. is the big sleeper here. And, uh, you know, as you said earlier on, the COVID lockdowns are still going on and they're still trying to do a bit, but they're talking about growth, what, 3.3 or something next year. Um, that could be another negative draft in terms of overall momentum in Australia, which could have a significant impact, but also potentially disrupt supply chains and therefore create more inflation pressures again. Exactly. I mean, if China has a really challenging winter, like so many other countries have had, since the since the pandemic began and you know we're still talking about lockdowns and you know widespread lockdowns in major cities industrial centers in sort of you know end of february march even into the start of april next year you're going to have you're going to have more supply chain issues and frankly 
it's entirely possible that with that we could have seen supply chain issues even now, if not for the fact that you are that that companies have built up such enormous inventories throughout 2022. Yeah, and those inventories around the world are amazing. I was listening to somebody talking about the US and the retailers there. They're stacked to the gunnels with stuff they're trying to shift. So they're now discounting heavily to try and move it. So yeah, exactly. Now, this is this is another uh, thing that speaks to what you, was, you and I were discussing before, that just basically as a percentage of total assets, households have got more cash than at any time in the, at least the last 30 years in aggregate. And this is and this this actually breaks it down by wealth percentile. So even you know middle income households in aggregate are sitting on a big, big pile of cash. Now, naturally, there are a lot of households who are going to be sit, sitting on exactly nothing or, in a lot of cases, a lot of debt. But in aggregate, there is a lot of money sitting there and that could keep keep powering things along at a reasonable rate for quite some time. And I think that's what's really blindsided a lot of people this year, that, that it's kept the US economy, relative, we'll call it relatively strong or relatively okay, because things haven't rolled over in the way that people would have expected. No, and that's partly, of course, because of the massive stimulus that was thrown into households earlier on. A lot of people saved it because they didn't, couldn't spend it, didn't want to spend it. So they're running off, um, you know, those reserves. But again, it's unequal distribution. Yeah, exactly. Now, what the Fed wants to see is US financial conditions tighten. To, to get to to get to a point where they are in by their metrics putting downward pressure on inflation. In recent months, we've seen the market rally. We've seen not recent months, recent weeks. We've seen the market rally. We've seen bond yields come down, and we've seen the swift one of the swiftest loosenings of financial conditions since that since they began measuring them at Goldman back in the early nineteen nineties. We recently saw financial conditions, as the measured by the Chicago Fed, fall to the same level that they were in June, when the federal funds rate was one percent. So the Fed isn't seeing that that tightening of financial conditions that it wants to see to start to put downward pressure on inflation. So the question is: is what what are they going to do? Are they going to just sort of let this one slide? Are they just going to let the market have its moment, or are we going to see more aggressive? overtones from Powell or something else that potentially shock the market down the road. It's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, the key point there, of course, is that as the um, financial markets are moving up, that's not what they want to see. So several of the Fed's uh, members, senior members, have said, we got to, you know, we want to see the markets calm down and go backwards a bit. So it's going the wrong way at the moment. So they got another reason to put rates up even more. Well, that, exactly, and that's that's part of the problem. If the market keeps having this reaction to anything, not even anything that resembles dovishness, it's just anything that resembles a narrative on which the market can hang its hat and rally, then the Fed might have to keep raising rates and raising rates and raising rates to get financial conditions where they are. I mean, who knows? Maybe that's five and a quarter, maybe that's five and a half percent, or maybe it's even higher. It just, we, we don't know. I mean, and I think it's also just worth noting that for American households, not so much American businesses, but for American households, their, their pain point for interest rates is a lot, lot higher than it is in most of the world. That's true. That's exactly right. And, well, the markets are saying it could be above five now, so we'll, we'll see how that uh, that plays out. <laughs> I always uh, I chuckle every time I see the market saying, whoopee, it's time to expand. Oh, hang on a moment. Just remember what you're doing. What you're doing is actually giving the ammunition to the Fed to say you've got to raise up even more. So, you know, just hold back maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? You know, because you not only that, you've got this, you know, reopening in China that's actually turned into a lockdown in China. Yep. And the markets rally on that. They still haven't given back those gains, I might add. No. So they've further loosened loosened things into a, into a situation that is quantifiably worse. And oil is also down as well, right? Partly because yeah. of lack of demand from China, which, of course, is actually, again, from a sort of you know, demand perspective makes demand easier. So again, everything's pulling, <laughs> pulling the, the 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 argument one way, which is you need higher rates. Yeah, exactly. It's a it's a hilarious you know conflagration of events. But you know, 
I just it's it's going to be interesting to see if Powell can you know hold hold the line against you know the, the increasing levels of what I can only imagine is vocal dissent from elements of the the FOMC. Absolutely. Now this is an interesting one because it basically shows that U.S. muscle U.S. classic muscle cars are a nice little indicator of where the economy is going. <laughs> if you because it they rolled over just before the U.S. went into recession in in the global financial crisis and they rolled over again as things were deteriorating in 2019 because it was expected that there would be a recession sometime in 2020 you have the yield curve inversion and all the other different indicators showing that things were deteriorating you know job openings etc so i think it's interesting that americans the, this particular little indicator hasn't rolled over yet so I'm not saying that, you know, that it's perfect or even that it's all that good, but it's just an interesting little tidbit, I think, that that's that, that, that sort of subset of America hasn't really seen things roll over and, you know, people haven't yet acted accordingly. No, well, it goes back to this idea that there's a lot of conflicting data and lots of different indicators pointing in different directions, which is, of course, why it's sometimes difficult. But the markets always go for the the positive, right, you know, the hopium, because they always want to expect uh, future earnings to be higher, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is we, we may not be there. And I, if I was sitting in Fedland, I'd be scratching my head thinking, well, I've got this set of data pointing this way. I've got this set of data pointing this way. Where do I place my bet? Yeah, ex exactly. I mean, you know, I, I think that we might see a sort of a little bit more measured approach from the Fed of, you know, 50, 25, 25, 25. But that's still higher rates. And I mean, I, I just come back to, if you had have said to someone at the start of this year that we were going to close out the year with a federal funds rate at nearly 5%, you know, whether it's 4.5, 4.75 or 5 or whatever it ends up being. And, and the, the fact that the market was going to roar on that, they would have been like, okay, all right, that's that's great. We'll get you one of those nice jackets that you can keep your arms nice and close to yourself, nice and warm and cart you off to a padded room. People would have thought you were nuts, yeah. but here we are. Absolutely right. Yep. Yep. Okay. Now, this is an interesting one that I think is probably worth finishing on that shows that the number of mentions of reshoring or onshoring by US companies has surged to its highest level ever. Now, this is, this is uh, indicative of the, the CHIPS Act where they're bringing, up, where they're bringing uh, semiconductor, okay, uh, computer chip manufacturing back to the US and well basically just the fact that that people a lot of people are losing faith in globalized supply chains particularly those that are based in China so I think it's a rather little interesting one that basically that, that if this continues to happen and they spend you know hundreds of billions of dollars on capital expenditure to, to, to you know to rebuild this industrial capacity or to you know reshore this industrial capacity, Probably, probably more like trillions, I should say, over the coming years, that's going to be inflationary. And goods over the last 25 years have generally been a neutral or even deflationary impact on the CPI. So all it takes is, you know, a half a percent, one percent contribution to have the headline US CPI and boom, all of a sudden you're above the 2% target and you've got problems. Absolutely. I actually think that the reshoring... And the other one I'd put in the same category is empty shipping containers, right? Because those are the two things that I think are moving very quickly, right? There's a lot of spare capacity now in international shipping and lots of you know, containers just stuck with nothing to do. <laughs> right? uh, we aren't out of this yet, right? No, and I think one of the, the really interesting things in all of this is just the, the knock-on effect that this is going to cause. You know, we have seen because of the high inventory levels that we mentioned previously, because of the fact that we are starting to see demand wane, you know, you're starting to see the US trucking sector get hit hard by it by lower by lower freight costs. You know, you're starting to see ship, you know, ships sitting there or getting laid up, or as you say, idle shipping containers. But the thing that happens is that things never really find a long-term equilibrium. Yep. They they tend to oscillate between extremes. And I think that's going to be one of the big problems going forward that we, because we're going to see this, this capacity because they've got such huge inventories, because they've got so much stock, you are going to see the capacity of these systems shrink, you know, which is perfectly logical. 
technically speaking. But the problem is, is that it, uh, the way I see it is if you do start to see inflation come down and, you, you know, there's a justification given to Biden or whoever's sitting in the White House at the time that they can start throwing money around again, they will. And then all of a sudden you, you're back where you started. You've got supply chain issues and you've got transport bottlenecks and everything <laughs> and everything old is new again. Absolutely right. Back in the old spin cycle once again, and we'll go around the houses a couple more times, shall we, and see where we end up next time. <laughs> yeah, well, that's 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 how I see it all. You're paying out the old inflationary yo-yo. You know, I, yep. I mean, I'd like to think it can be avoided that that Powell and Biden and everyone can can you know put their heads together and be smart and just take you know take the recession and deal with it in a normal manner. But I don't really see that happening. I see them just throwing more money at the system. And I mean, maybe Powell does hold the line. Maybe, you know, you see the full burnout economics thing of him raising rates and Biden throwing money at the economy. But yeah, I, I, I don't really, I don't really see this sort of being the end of inflationary pressures. I think that we could see deflationary pressures for quite some time, but then bam, you know, you got the old, you know, they start throwing money at things, core inflationary pressures simmering and, you know, you're back where you started. And uh, interestingly, of course, that um, the Treasury in the US is almost making noises about doing you know, Reserve Bank type things, right? Almost creating a, a parallel <laughs> set of systems. Yeah, it seems like Yellen wants our old job back, eh? Right. You know? Exactly, just, yeah. One, yeah. One Reserve Bank is not enough. We'll have two. That'll solve it. And then we'll just put a central bank digital currency wrap around it because they're piloting that now in the US as well. And she'll be right. Yeah, and you know we'll 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 all have scores, and you know this will ex this this piece of currency will expire this time, and you're only allowed to spend it here. And right, oh, right. what did you say on social media? And just remember, the Federal Reserve said in a, one of their reports a few months ago, the central bank digital currency will give us additional tools for monetary policy ex you know execution. So just remember that. It, it's such a, it's it's such a horrible idea. You know, mm -hmm. I mean. You know, even if you even if you take out you know all the sort of various issues with privacy, with them knowing exactly what you're doing, when you're doing it, and everything else, it's just it's just silly. Can we? I just, I mean, it's like that 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 article that you and I were discussing about on Twitter in terms of you know that QE needs to be consigned to the to the rubbish dump of history. You know, a, this, a huge huge mistake was made. You know, yes. like we abandoned hard money. We abandoned this idea that that you know that the system needs to function on its own. And now we've pumped it, you know, full of, you know, all these artificial things to keep it going. We should be taking this opportunity to stop. Yep. They won't. No. Nope. But we should. I mean, I don't know. I, you know, like, I think it was Daniel Martino Booth who said on Twitter recently that Powell wants to break the Fed put, that he needs to break the Fed put because basically the stock market is, you know, this is something that um, David Rosengren made a point about the other day, that basically the, the stock market and everything is just sucking in so much capital rather than that capital being deployed productively. I mean, in, in some ways it, it parallels what happens in here in Australia with the housing market. So, you know, and as long as the Fed put exists and as long as you're removing that level of risk, then it's going to keep happening. So I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe Powell has the balls for it, but if he, the, does he have the, the tenacity, shall we say, to fight with Brainard and the rest of the doves for the next <laughs> Yeah. 18 months or even a couple of years to actually push that through. Well, I actually have this theory that, um, you know, turkeys don't normally vote for Christmas, right? Um, and, and so you're not going to see the Reserve Bank doing things or the Fed doing things that's going to actually reduce their power and influence and control. That's not, they're not built for that. So you know, you're going to expect more tools, more levers, you know, more of this, more of that, more than the other. Whereas actually sometimes maybe the right answer is just pull back and recognise you stuffed up over the last 20 years, do less rather than do more. Now, that's a nice idea. I, and I think, I, think that's, I think that's the way it should be approached because hmm. I think one of the things that it would do is it would make the Fed's intervention more impactful when they do it. You know, the market is already having this, you know, Pavlovian reaction to, to any form of Fed intervention. So maybe the answer is that, you know, less is more, that they can do a lot more with a lot less. I mean, we saw that recently with the, uh, um, with the Bank of England. You know, yep. they did this very, very small bond purchase, under yep. 20 billion pounds worth of bonds, and they managed to completely stabilise the market. 
just because of that Pavlovian reaction of the market going, oh, shit, QE, better buy some bonds. Yeah, yeah. But that's more surgical, you see. And I actually think that's what that's how they should be thinking rather than, you know, shock and awe and controlling more levers and, you know, doing all those things. But, hey, uh, that's not, as I said, they don't, they don't vote, f- vote for Christmas. Turkeys don't vote for Christmas. I don't see any reduction in power anytime soon, unfortunately. But uh, to the um, detriment of ordinary households and businesses here in, in the US and other places too, because central banks, I think, have, well, I've said it before, I think they've lost the plot. I still think that they're actually able to walk on water and um, juggle at the same time, but uh, I'm not less convinced. I actually think that we could see a targeted approach for a time Mm. because they're forced into it by inflation. But I think that that targeted approach is going to be harder and harder to defend if headline inflation does come down. And, you know, considering things like, say, for example, particularly in Europe, you know, you're going to see huge, huge base effects in energy and energy price inflation, you know, over the next, you know, 18 months. And it's going to be, you know, potentially a similar story, say, like with used cars in the US over the next, you know, 12, 18 months, two years, depending on how long that takes to mean revert. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of attempts to justify going back to the good old days when in actual fact what they should be doing is continuing to do as little as humanly possible to just keep them, just to keep the markets and keep everything going rather than this insane fire hose of liquidity that they just start waving around wildly every time something even, you know, sort of looks like going wrong. Absolutely. Well, Tarek, a very enjoyable conversation. We should explain to people that uh, you had a bit of a bandwidth problem towards the end, which is why you've gone a little stuttery, but we got all of it, which is good. <laughs> um, thanks uh, to the NBN, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Modern technology, don't you just love it? Oh, it's, it's just working perfectly. I love having my internet drop out every couple of hours when yeah. I'm trying to do my work. Yeah, it's quite convenient, isn't it? But thank you very much. Thanks for all the slides, and we'll put the links and stuff be- below for those who want to uh, follow along. And uh, I guess we'll do it all in a couple more weeks' time, and there'll be yet more things to talk about, of course. Yeah, well, we'll see if there's the old Santa rally and you know what ends up happening with markets because they're, they're, they're looking awfully volatile right now. Indeed. Thanks very much, Tarek. See you later. Thanks very much. See you later, mate. See ya. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.